Good evening, section Z. It's time for our next lecture in the takings chapter. And we're gonna focus on the case of Penn Central Transportation Company versus City of New York, uh, which is kind of a preeminent case on the tests that are employed for deciding whether a regulation of land use or property constitutes a taking. Um, so let me pull up the Penn Central case here. Over on page 632. So the property at issue in this case was Grand Central Terminal in New York, a uh, famous old train station uh, in the city. Um, the regulation is a historic landmark designation. So Grand Central Terminal has been designated as a historic landmark under New York's laws. Um, the effect of that designation is that you can't alter the exterior architectural features of the landmark without approval from the landmark, Landmarks Preservation Commission. Um, now, that is the burden imposed by the regulation. There also are some benefits that are uh, given to properties that are designated as landmarks. Um, so under New York's law, if you own real property that has been designated as a landmark and you haven't developed the property fully to the extent permitted by the zoning laws, then you are allowed to transfer those development rights to certain other pieces of property. Um, and so here, uh, with respect to the Grand Central Terminal, since they have not developed the property, the space above the building, um, they may be able to transfer that to other buildings and develop them in a way that the zoning laws otherwise would not permit. So Penn Central, uh, which owns Grand Central Terminal, wants to build a 55-story office building over the terminal. And so they submit a couple of plans for that office building, um, both by the same designer. Um, one of them uh, would keep the Grand Central Terminal itself in pretty much the same condition that it has been, but would construct a, uh, an office building above the terminal uh, for 55 stories. Um, the other one uh, that they're calling Brewer 2 uh, would make the terminal itself look very different and put the 55 stories above it. Um, so those proposals are submitted to the Landmarks uh, Preservation Commission and both are rejected. Uh, one of them on the ground that it is an aesthetic joke, um, and the other on the ground that it would change the appearance of the ex appearance of the exterior of the terminal. Um, so, the court has to think about whether this regulation uh, has the effect of a taking of Penn Central's property. And so, over on page six thirty nine the court gets into the test that they're going to employ for deciding whether a regulation amounts to a taking. Um, and notice how they characterize the test. They say there has been, they've been unable to develop any set formula for determining when uh, you have to give compensation uh, for economic injuries caused by a government regulation. Um, they say that the inquiry depends largely upon the particular circumstances in each case. Uh, they describe the inquiry as an essentially ad hoc factual inquiry. Um, but at the same time, the court says there are certain factors that will be important in analyzing whether a particular regulation amounts to a taking. And so they say one is the economic impact of the regulation on the claimant and particularly the extent to which the regulation has interfered with distinct investment-backed expectations. Um, and then secondly, the character of the governmental action. They say that taking may more readily be found when the interference can be characterized as a physical invasion by the government 
than when interference arises from some public program adjusting the benefits and burdens of economic life to promote the common good. Now, we have talked in the connection with the Pennsylvania coal case about this issue of conceptual severance. When you are trying to determine how much diminution of value there has been as a result of a regulation, what is the denominator of the fraction? What is the, the thing that you focus on in determining how much value has been taken away? And the court addresses that over on page 640. Um, and here the issue is, um, you know, whether you can focus on the effect on the air rights above the property uh, and say that there's been kind of a, a larger, you know, complete taking of that, of those air rights. And the majority rejects that analysis. They say taking jurisprudence does not divide a single parcel into discrete segments and attempt to determine whether rights in a particular segment have been entirely abrogated. In deciding whether a particular governmental action has affected a taking, this court focuses rather both on the character of the action and on the nature and extent of the interference with rights in the parcel as a whole. Here, the city tax block designated as the landmark site. Um, and so they seem to be siding pretty clearly with Brandeis from the Pennsylvania coal case and say that we've got to look at the effect on the entire piece of property, all rights in that property, uh, not carve out one right in particular for our analysis. So the first factor the court said back on the previous page was the economic impact of the regulation on the claimant. Um, so what's the economic impact here of this designation as a historical landmark? Uh, well, it does reduce the property value to some extent. It makes it more difficult, maybe even impossible, to build above the terminal, terminal although the court suggests that, you know, maybe you should try uh, a smaller building and see if you would still get rejected. But um, it does tend to reduce the value of the property. Um, at the same time, it doesn't make it valueless. It still can be used in profitable ways. Um, one of the things that comes into the court's thinking is the set of transferable development rights. Um, the fact that you can take the right to develop above this property and transfer it to a different property that you own. And the court says that may not comp uh, amount to just compensation for a taking, but to the extent that you are focusing on the economic impact of the regulation, it does tend to mitigate the financial burdens that the uh, regulation imposes. Now, one of the things they say you're supposed to focus on is the distinct investment-backed expectations underlying uh, the, uh, the effect of the regulation on investment-backed expectations. Um, so basically, you're looking at the extent to which the government regulation um, affects the reasonable expectations of the owner that led them to invest in the property in the first place. Um, which raises a question, if I get property by gift or device where I didn't pay anything for it, uh, so I haven't actually invested, does that make it less likely that I'm going to be found, uh, that a regulation will be found to be a taking of property? I'm not sure if that's, if that's the case. It may be that the court would look at the reasonable investment backed expectations of your predecessors in title who did, eventually, uh, who did uh, initially acquire the property. Uh, but what about here? What effect does this regulation have on the investment-backed expectations of Penn Central? Um, well, on page 642, um, the court gets into that. Um, they say that the New York City law does not interfere in any way with the present uses of the terminal. Um, its designation as a landmark not only permits, but contemplates that appellants may continue to use the property precisely as it has been used for the past 65 years as a railroad terminal containing office space and concessions. So the law does not interfere with what must be regarded as Penn Central's primary expectation concerning the use of the property. 
right? So, uh, and it, it, they go on to say that it lets them get a reasonable return on their investment. But um, presumably when Penn Central bought the property, their, their primary expectation was that um, we can keep doing with it what has been done with it for 65 years, and the regulation has not interfered with that at all. Um, and so that is significant to the court. Um, now, what about the character of the government action in this case? Um, and here, the court focuses on um, a case called United States versus Cosby, uh, which is discussed back here on 641. Um, the Cosby case found a taking where there were flights over a farm uh, by military aircraft. The military aircraft were flying low over the farm, I think as they were nearing the, the uh, landing strip. Um, and the, the vibrations and the noise from those overflights was causing damage to the farm. Um, and in that case, the Supreme Court found that there was a taking. But the court decides that this is not a case like Cosby, um, in this case, there's been no government invasion of the airspace above uh, Grand Central Terminal. Uh, and so it's not remotely like Cosby where the airspace above the ter terminal was, uh, uh, above the property was in the flight pattern for military aircraft. Um, and so this is more in the nature of um, what the court describes as a program, um, a public program adjusting the benefits and burdens of economic life to promote the common good and less like a physical invasion of the property by the government. Now, the ultimate conclusion is that there's no taking in this case. I want to note one other case that's important that the Supreme Court discusses. Um, they make a reference to a case back on page 640 uh, called Hadachik versus Sebastian. And what they note about that case is that in, uh, even if there's an 87.5% diminution in the value of property, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean there has been a taking. You get a little bit more information about the Hadachic case in the dissenting opinion down on page 643. Um, the, court tell, or the dissenters tell us as early as 1887, the court recognized that the government can prevent a property owner from using his property to injure others without having to compensate the owner for the value of the forbidden use. Thus, there is no taking when it, where a city prohibits the operation of a brickyard within a residential area, citing Hadachik versus Sebastian. Um, and so basically, this was a case where you had some property that had uh, clay on it that was really valuable for making bricks, and there was a brickyard that had been operating there, and the city decided that it was too close to a residential zone, and so it zoned the area so you could no longer make bricks on that property, um, and that resulted in uh, property that, the, according to the plaintiffs, was worth $800,000 for brick making, but was only worth $60,000 for other purposes. So that's where the 87.5% diminution in value comes from. Um, Hadachik is thought of as standing for the proposition that if property use amounts to a nuisance, then the government can prevent you from causing a nuisance to your neighbors, and that that will not constitute a taking of property. Um, so does that principle help us resolve this case? Could you decide the Penn Central case based upon uh, the nuisance analysis? Um, very unlikely. Um, this is not a health and safety regulation. The landmark designation is not designed to prevent somebody from operating a nuisance. Instead, it's just trying to preserve property that is deemed valuable for the city and for, for neighbors. Um, but the proposed use by Penn Central uh, building, the office building, would not create a nuisance for any of the neighboring property owners. And so that principle probably doesn't help us resolving this case. So that gives you a, a sense of the nature of the inquiry when the court is trying to decide whether there's been a regulatory taking and the types of questions that it asks.